Let's pick up from where we left off. Dennett's body was in Tulsa, and his brain was in a laboratory in Houston. Then, the wireless connection between the two was severed. In an instant, Dennett found his perspective shift nearly 500 miles south when he could no longer perceive his environment in Tulsa. This shift in perspective was so jarring that Dennett momentarily wonders if he had discovered evidence for the existence of an immaterial soul. After all, what else besides a transcendent soul could possibly traverse such a distance in an instant? But this turns out not to be any such evidence for a soul at all. Just as this feeling of euphoria is subsiding, and panic and dread are setting in, the technical support team directly induces a dreamless coma to his brain. By the time that Dennett wakes up, as it turns out, nearly a year had passed. Well, so much for the proof of an existence for the soul. The interruption in his consciousness, chemically induced, begs the question of just what went on during the time he was unconscious. Back to the essay. Dennett eventually wakes to find that his brain is now linked with another body. His original body, of course, is dead beneath Tulsa. But clearly, Dennett feels that he has survived his adventure because he retains all of his personality and memories. That is, there is a psychological continuity across Dennett prior to the surgery, after being separated from his body, and now with a new body. This continuity leads him to think that he is the same, that is, numerically same, person. In this new body, Dennett decides to test the wireless system. But as he does so, he discovers that he is not currently connected to his brain. Instead, he is connected to a computer that has duplicated his brain in perfect detail. By the way, there is ongoing research to map the human brain, including every single one of 100 billion neurons in both the US and in Europe. Very exciting stuff. Alright, so Dennett is able to switch back and forth between his original organic brain and the computer brain without any perceptible difference. The question of where he is and who he is has decidedly become even more complicated. Dennett is either dead beneath Tulsa, or he is alive in his new body, or he's been alive all along in his organic brain, or he is also, quote, alive in the computer. Is his computer brain any less him than the organic brain? Now, before you answer too quickly, let's put ourselves back into his shoes. What if I told you that right now you were connected to a computer brain? You wouldn't dismiss your existence now, as such, to be irrelevant, would you? You would still feel like you are you. There is still a psychological continuity here. And what would happen now if the computer brain were given its own body? Then where would you be? Where would then it be? And what if both bodies were identical clones created from the original body's stem cells? According to Parfi and VC reading, which you also completed for today, both would have equal psychological continuity with the original unified Dennett prior to this adventure. For a while in this essay, the organic brain and the computer brain are running in perfect sync. What one thinks and feels, so does the other one also. But toward the end, we discover that they've started to move out of sync with each other and are having different kinds of thoughts and perceptions. Given that each maintains having the same sense of psychological continuity, how should we say one is more authentic or deserving of the identity than the other? To simply insist that the organic brain should have priority because it is original or natural does not solve this issue. As we've noted in our previous discussion about informal fallacies, we don't want to commit the common mistake of attributing some special status to things simply because they are quote natural or unnatural. Is there some logically sound argument for why the organic, simply by the virtue of having come first, should have priority? What can justify such biological chauvinism? After all, your own body by now has replaced itself several times since you were born. If we reconstituted your body from all the replaced parts, 
then which would be the real you? For example, if we have the Starship Enterprise and we gradually refit the ship with all new parts, piece by piece, but simultaneously save all the old parts such that at the end we have two ships with the registry NCC-1701, we should wonder which is the Enterprise. As long as they remain in orbit, they are having roughly the same experiences, and their onboard computers have the identical information, but once they leave space dock and start having different adventures, then it becomes harder to say that such and such was done by the Enterprise. Now, as confusing as answering that question might be, it's actually simpler with inanimate objects because we don't tend to think that they are imbued with the kind of uniqueness that we are as persons. So back to the issue at hand, personal identity. What makes you you and not somebody else? Also, the notion that psychological continuity establishes numerical sameness is not foolproof. You could say that you are the same person you were yesterday because there is a close psychological continuity between the person you were yesterday and the person that you are today. But how well do you remember yourself as an infant? And how will the person you become in, say, 40 years regard the memories of yourself as you are at this moment? It seems that the more time passes, the more tenuous and uncertain that that connection becomes. We will pursue these issues further in class before making the segue to consider the problem of free will and determinism. In the meantime, consider the possibility that the premise emerging from our everyday common sense understanding of life, that you are somehow in possession of a stable and unique personal identity that remains numerically same across time is false. In other words, you, as such, may not exist after all.